As of the day I'm recording this new intro, on the 16th of February 2022, marks the 80th anniversary of the Banker Island Massacre. So here is the story of Matron Vivian Bullwinkle, episode 3 of season 1. In the original recording, I mentioned that the Australian College of Nursing was attempting to raise funds for a statue of Vivian Bullwinkle to go on the grounds of the Australian War Memorial. But as of today, the college is also attempting to raise a million dollars to create a scholarship fund in the honour of each of the 21 nurses who were executed off Raji Beach 80 years ago, to keep the legacy of these women who we are proud and love of alive. Please note that this episode contains the discussion of the sexual assault and murder of women during wartime. If you want to avoid the discussion, skip the end of the episode. The exact times are given in the show notes. Take care of yourself. It is the 16th of February, 1942, during the Second World War, and the survivors of the sunk transport, the SS Vernabrook, 22 nurses in all, have just surrendered to the Japanese. They're ordered by their captors into the sea. They were walked in, shoulder to shoulder, red cross armbands worn like shields. The last words heard by these brave women was from a matron saying, Chin up girls, I'm proud and love you all, before they'd be promptly machine gunned. Only one would survive. This is their story. Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast. This is the life, service, and legacy of Matron Lieutenant Colonel Vivian Bullwinkle, who served in the Second World War and was the sole survivor of the Banker Island Massacre. This is a re-release of Episode 3 of Season 1, originally released on the 8th of August, 2021. Enjoy. She was born on the 18th of December, 1915, in Kapunda, South Australia, with her parents arriving in the country from England three years before. Vivian completed her general nursing training at the Broken Hill and District Hospital in far western New South Wales in 1938 at the age of 23, and completed her midwifery certification the following year. From there, she moved to Hamilton, Victoria to commence work as a nurse. In 1940, as threat of war in the Pacific loomed, Vivian relocated to Melbourne to assist in the war effort, working at the Jesse McPherson Hospital in Clayton, a suburb of Melbourne. She was initially ineligible for overseas service as there was a requirement at the time for all Australian military nurses to have a minimum of 12 months military experience, be 25, and have to have been completed both ward and surgical training before they could be accepted for military service. In 1941, Initially, Vivian applied to join the Royal Australian Air Force Nursing Service, but was rejected on medical grounds. However, successful in their application to the 2nd Australian Imperial Force in May 1941, and commenced army training at the Pakapanyal Military Camp in Victoria on the 9th of August that year. On the 2nd of September, Vivian Bullwinkle was transferred to the Australian Army Nursing Service and assigned to the 2nd 13th Australian General Hospital, or AGH, as a staff nurse bound for Malaya aboard the Australian hospital ship Wanganella. At this time, as the war in Europe was looking bleak for the British, they had started to strip their overseas garrisons and territories to reinforce the home islands for the expected German invasion. This left the defence of these territories to Dominion troops, primarily from Australia, India and Canada. The Dominions were autonomous communities within the British Empire who were essentially self-governing and returned for extended loyalty to the British Empire. In the Second World War, Britain made extensive use of these forces in North Africa, the Middle East, and the Pacific. In fact, Australia already had two divisions of the Second Australian Imperial Force, the 7th and 6th uh, Divisions, in the North African Desert, and the 3rd, the 8th Division, was being raised at the same time as the formation of the 2nd 13th General Hospital, and would actually join them in Malaya to serve alongside Indian and British forces. Now, there was already an Australian General Hospital in Malaya at the time, the 2nd Tent, as well as the 24th Casualty Clearing Station. While in Malaya, Staff Nurse Bullwinkle would regularly transfer between these units, based in both Singapore and Sumatra, primarily dealing with the large number of tropical-based afflictions. In October 1941, Bullwinkle would be based in Johor Bahru in Malaya and would stay there until December 1941, when the Japanese would commence their land invasion of the Malayan Peninsula. Just a point of historical context, the Japanese launched their invasion of Malaya 10 hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor, and simultaneously with the attacks on Hong Kong, Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines. While the defenders of Malaya would try and stall the Japanese advance until hoped for reinforcements from either the British home islands or America arrived, though were never guaranteed and were never going to come, 
The strategic downside of Britain's reliance on Dominion troops and the Allies' policy of prioritizing on winning the war in Europe disadvantaged the Australian British and Indian troops, as they were largely inexperienced, overall poorly led, and undersupplied and equipped. Now, this isn't to discount the brave actions of the individual soldiers in the defense. They were simply facing a much more experienced, motivated, and eager Japanese force, who already had over 10 years of combat experience behind them. Even the arrival of the Royal Navy battleships, HMS Prince of Wales and Repulse, though a massive boon to morale, couldn't halt the rapid and devastating Japanese advance, as they would be sunk on the 10th of December, just two days later. Despite these setbacks, the Allies would fight valiantly until January, when the 2nd 13th, along with British and Dominion troops, would be pushed back to the tiny island fortress of Singapore. On the 12th of February, and the fall of Singapore in reality, it was decided that more than 300 predominantly European civilians and government officials and wounded soldiers, along with 65 nurses, would be evacuated aboard the Royal Yacht of Sarawak, the SS Werner Brook. It is at this time that Sister Bullwinkle's service record goes silent, as she will be officially listed as missing in action on the 16th of February 1942, as the garrison would officially surrender to the Japanese that day. This is, however, not where her story ends. On Valentine's Day 1942, Japanese aircraft would locate the Werner Brook and attack it with machine guns and bombs, sinking it and forcing the survivors overboard. Twelve nurses would be killed in the sinking, however most would make it to life rafts or cling to debris. Of those that survived, 22 nurses, including Staff Nurse Bullwinkle, washed ashore on Raji Beach on Banker Island in the Dutch East Indies in what is now modern-day Indonesia. The remainder would either be lost at sea, or go down with the ship, or wash ashore on other islands. They would be joined by a large number of survivors, mainly wounded and civilians, and while on the beach over the next two days would be joined by an additional 100 British soldiers from another ship that had been sunk in the area. Once together, the group assessed their options. After they determined their location and discovered it had already fallen to the Japanese, it was decided that the survivors of the Werner Brook would surrender, and the chief engineer of the Werner Brook set out for the nearest inhabited settlement to officiate this. While they waited, Irene Drummond, the matron of the 2nd 13th AGH, urged the civilians in their company to make their way to the island's capital of Montauk and leave the wounded men to be cared by the nurses. By mid-morning, the ship's engineer returned with a party of approximately 15 Japanese soldiers to officiate the surrender. While there, they immediately segregated the survivors into two groups based on their gender, and then they forced all the walking wounded soldiers to head inland under guard, leaving the nurses and the more critically wounded on the beach. The walking wounded would be killed, though the manner in which that happened is disputed. Some accounts state that they were machine gunned, to others they were bayoneted. Some claim stating that some tried to make their way into the sea to escape, only to be gunned down. When the Japanese soldiers returned, and they sat down amongst the nurses and cleaned the blood off their weapons, it became apparent what had just happened. Training women, 22 nurses, and one civilian were then ordered into the surf as a machine gun was set up on the beach in front of them. They reportedly entered the sea shoulder to shoulder, their Red Cross armbands standing there, but doing little against what came next. Once they were waist deep, the Japanese opened fire on them, killing them, all save for Vivian Bullwinkle. The last words heard before the shooting was from Matron Drummond saying, Chin up girls, I'm proud and love you all. Sister Bullwinkle was struck once high on the right hip and floated motionlessly amongst the surf, playing dead for approximately 10 minutes until the Japanese departed. She would then return to the beach and crawl to nearby bushland where she passed out for several days until she was discovered by Private Patrick Kingsley, a wounded survivor of the initial killings. Tending to each other's wounds, and they were joined by another survivor, Stoker Ernest Lloyd, after 12 days of relying on help from the locals, it was decided that it was in their best interest to surrender to the Japanese military garrison, the three deciding to admit the fact that they were survivors of what is now called the Banker Island Massacre. After their surrender, the three would be separated, and sadly, Kingsley would die in captivity. Bullwinkle would be reunited with, in the prisoner of war camp in Sumatra with the remaining nurses of the Werner Brook, and she would tell them of her story and promise them not to speak of it for fear that her safety would be in jeopardy if they found out that she was a witness to the massacre. For the next three and a half years, Sister Bullwinkle would move around Indonesian prisoner of war camps until she was liberated in September 1945. At this point, she would be only one of 24 of the 65 nurses of the Werner Brook to survive the war. 
After a brief stay in hospital to recover from the effects of her captivity, Sister Bullwinkle, now a lieutenant as she'd been promoted in absentia in 1943, would continue to serve, now part of the British Commonwealth Occupation Force in Japan, until her resignation from the Australian Imperial Force at the rank of captain in 1947 to assume the post as Director of Nursing at the Fairfield Infectious Disease Hospital, a position she would hold until 1977. In 1947, she would also testify before the War Crimes Tribunal in Tokyo about what had happened during her captivity at the hands of the Japanese. She would also remain part of the Citizens Military Force, eventually retiring from the military entirely at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 1970. After the war, Matron Bullwinkle continued to be active and devoted her life to nursing and honouring those who had died on the Banker Island Massacre. She also continued to raise funds for memorials dedicated to nurses and served on several committees, including being the first woman to be a member of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, and as well as becoming the president of the Australian College of Nursing. In 1975, during another conflict, Matron Bullwinkle would once again work with the military as her hospital had been selected to receive orphans evacuated from the Vietnam War. Despite being in her 60s, she organised and led a nursing team to Vietnam to oversee the Australian side of the operation of what is called Operation Babylift. Matron Bullwinkle, at 62, her nursing career over, married Colonel Francis West Statham in September 1977 and moved to Perth, Western Australia. She would continue to remain active in her philanthropic roles and in 1992, she would actually return to Banker Island to unveil a monument to those who had been killed. Throughout her life, Vivian Bullwinkle had well-earned awards and commendations bestowed upon her. She was a recipient of the Florence Nightingale Medal, Associate Member of the Royal Red Cross, Member of the British Empire, and an Officer of the Order of Australia. She would also have several portions of hospitals, care facilities, nursing residences, and sections of military facilities named in her honour. Vivian Bullwinkle died of a heart attack on the 3rd of July 2000 at the age of 84. After her death, she would be posthumously inducted to the Victorian Honour Roll for Women, an honour roll recognising the achievements of women from Victoria, which is ironic considering she came from South Australia. More recently, with the 80th anniversary of the Banker Island Massacre in 2022 approaching, the Australian College of Nursing is currently raising funds for the construction of a bronze statue of Matron Bullwinkle to be placed on the grounds of the Australian War Memorial. A link to the donation will be placed in the show notes. I can say with great certainty that as a people, we are truly proud of, of her. And there you have it, the story of Lieutenant Colonel, Matron, Vivian Bullwinkle, and this next section I will be discussing the 2017 allegations of sexual assault against the nurses on Banker Island. If this is not something that you wish to hear, please feel free to end the episode now, and I will catch you next time with the story of Captain David Twining of the 48th Battalion, who served during the First World War. And again, take care of yourself. Unsurprisingly, this part of the episode has probably been the most difficult to write and record, but it would be remiss of me if I didn't discuss what was uncovered in 2017 following the investigative work of historian Lynette Silver, broadcaster Tess Lawrence, and biographer Barbara Angle. In the main section of this episode, I gave what is considered the official account of what happened on Banker Island, that the nurses were marched into the sea and were gunned down, leaving only Vivian Bullingle as the sole survivor. Sadly, it would seem that this is not all that happened. Following an interview in 2000 with Tess Williams, Vivian Bullwinkle stated that most of the nurses had been violated prior to their murder. Part of the reason why it took 75 years for this information to come to light is partly due to the fact that Vivian alleges that she was ordered not to speak of this by her military and political superiors, and was effectively gagged from ever speaking about it, especially during the 1946 and 47 Tokyo War Crimes Tribunals, where she was giving depositions on the Banker Island Massacre and the effects on the nurses while in captivity in Indonesia. However, this is not just the account of one person. Historian Lynette Silver and biographer Barbara Angle were also able to uncover a number of different interviews and accounts from other nurses and serving Japanese personnel who were on the island at the time, and have also been able to uncover a number of documents, some of which have been partially destroyed, which included official statements made by nurses and other survivors on the sinking of the Verna Brook, and in some instances, entire paragraphs have been deleted and sentences containing statements made by nurses suddenly end mid-sentence. Barbara Angle was also able to forensically investigate Vivian Bullwinkle's uniform and discovered, namely, that the buttons on the top of her bodice have been reattached with mismatched thread and are most likely the two buttons that are missing from the bottom of her uniform. 
which suggested that her uniform had been ripped open with enough force to dislodge them. She was also able to forensically determine that the only way that the bullet holes on Vivian Bullwinkle's uniform, which line up on next to her sternum, actually line up with her known wound sites, was if the uniform itself was open. Silver believes that if there was any reason why there was an official demand to keep Vivian quiet about the sexual assault, was was made with the best intentions to protect the families from knowing the details. It was under a misguided pretense to protect the virginal image of the nurses from the stigma associated with something that was considered very much taboo back in the 40s and 50s, and was considered a fate worse than death at the time. It also had in the fact that it was still a hangable offence in most states of Australia up until 1955. It is especially considering the fact that to be a nurse you had to be at least 25 and either be single or widowed. She also goes on to say that there potentially was a degree of guilt on behalf of the government and military officials who knew about Japanese troops who had raped and murdered British nurses in the St. Stephen's College Massacre during the fall of Hong Kong, but were slow to recall the Australian forces from Singapore. Sadly, the perpetrators of this massacre and the horrific assaults will remain unknown and probably have escaped punishment for their crimes. Sadly, this history will only ever also remain an allegation, but hopefully now that it's come to light, that some comfort can come to those who suffered. Next time on the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, it is the 5th of August, 1915, and a wounded soldier arrives with a message at the battalion headquarters of Lieutenant Colonel Raymond Lean, commanding officer of the 48th Battalion. The message reads simply, I'm the only one left. Do you still want me to hold this position? This scene would go on to form the basis of a diorama in the Australian War Memorial's First World War Gallery. Next time on the podcast, I give you the story of the sender of that message, Captain David Twining. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. I would really appreciate it and would help out the show if you would share this or leave a comment on Spotify or Google Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts, as it really helps others find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode with photos, show notes, and transcripts, head over to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram. Don't worry, there'll be a link in the description. If you want to follow me for more history hijinks and random nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at at Doc Winters. Once again, my name is Ross. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.